Um, now, I just want to open this talk by saying that some things we're going to be discussing are going to be quite, they may be quite triggering. We're going to be covering some heavy topics tonight. Um, and this might be get a bit intense. Uh, so if you need any, we have some resilience to resist resources, which should be shared in the chat now. And in there, you'll find just a load of different ways that you can really um, reinforce yourself and make sure that you are looking after yourself in the best way possible. So tonight's talk is going to be structured in two parts. First, we'll have the talks from our amazing and diverse panel of speakers. And some of our speakers are kindly taking their time out of previously committed to events. So just bear with us if there are any technical glitches or noises. These talks are then going to be followed by breakout rooms. And these breakout rooms will allow you to join a Just Stop Oil facilitator in a smaller group to discuss how you felt from the talk and what actions can be taken. This will last for about 10 to 15 minutes. So just to begin, my name is Anna Holland. Uh, I'm 21 years old. I identify as non-binary and bisexual, and I'm a university student. I've been a part of Just Stop Oil for just over a year now. Uh, you may recognize me as one of two through Super at Van Gogh Sunflowers. Now, normally these talks have a mention of the science behind the climate crisis, the causes, the consequences, the statistics. But if at this stage of a climate breakdown, you still believe that doing nothing is the best way to make sure we have a safe and happy future, then this talk is not for you. It is too late to spoon feed the science to those who choose ignorance and complicity. The fact that you're all of this talk, however, tells me that you do understand the weight of this catastrophe and you are ready to join this fight for our lives. I want to begin by talking about the effect the climate crisis is having on minority communities right now, what that means for LGB, for us LGBTQ plus people. I'm going to start with an example in Texas, USA, where temperatures have surpassed 40 degrees C, making it one of the hottest places on earth. This caused a surge of demand for air conditioning across the state. And how did the energy providers accommodate this increased demand? They rerouted electricity from their prisons. Since then, conditions have been life or death for the prisoners, who are predominantly people of colour, as they are being denied basic access to safe air. How long do you think it will be until America's anti-LGBTQ plus laws turn into prison sentences for queer people? If you're optimistic, you might say a year. How long do you think it will be until the prisons with no defense against these deadly heat waves will be disproportionately filled by members of our own community? How long do you think it will be until America's anti-LGBTQ plus laws make it across the ocean and infect our UK political system? A simple answer to that question is about negative three months when the UK government began changing the definitions of their 2010 Equality Act. And when we tell you that when the climate breakdown begins social breakdown, minority communities will suffer first, this is what we mean. Now, I'm a writer. I'm studying poetry at university and I've done a bit of writing for Just Off Oil recently, specifically the pieces we released regarding the Pride Action, which you'll hear about later. This topic, queer oppression as a result of climate breakdown, always takes me longer to write about than any other topic because it makes me too angry. Writing about how fucked my community is brings me closer to hopelessness every day. Why aren't we fighting more? Civil resistance is in our bones as queer people. Not a single one of us on this talk would be here today if not for the members of our community who fought and died for our rights. I want you all to take a minute now to try and picture what your life would look like if laws had not been broken and people had not resisted back in the 50s and 60s. Imagine, you're caught being yourself, you get sent to prison, a psychiatric hospital, you may be chemically castrated and beaten up, you could lose everything. Now I want you to take a look at where we are today. Thanks to the Stonewall rioters, to ACT UP, to Outrage, to all the queer people who fought relentlessly, we can be ourselves. We can marry whoever we want. We can adopt, raise families, live happy lives. But this does not mean that our fight is over. 
The continued existence of our community is being threatened every single day that the UK government refuses to end all new oil and gas projects. The UK government is in the pockets and the beds of the fossil fuel industry. Last year, the Conservatives received £3.5 million in legalised bribes from the industry and climate denying think tanks. £3.5 million that we know of. This has been reported. As long as they are being paid off by the fossil fuel industry, they will do nothing to protect us. We need to protect ourselves. We need to come together and fight for each other because when the climate breakdown inevitably causes the breakdown of society, no one is going to save us. So that's why we're all here tonight, to find out how we can take the first step toward building a community of resilience and resistance and how we can not only fight for, but win the future our predecessors died for. Now to build this collective power and be powerful in our multitude, there are three actions you can take to participate in Just Stop Oil right now, which you can pledge to on this call. The first thing you can do is donate. If you can give more, that's great, but as a minimum, we ask that once a month, you commit to giving earn in just an hour of your work. So if you earn £10 an hour, you will donate £10 a month. Your donation will help, will help hundreds of people who need support as they recruit others and take action up and down the country. Our donation link can be found on our website or in the Zoom chat just now. You could also volunteer. You could support Just Stop Oil by offering your skills and your time. Now, this can take on many different forms. It can look like helping to recruit in your own community, attending or hosting a local talk, uh, ringing people who are interested in Just Stop Oil. It can range from admin to video editing to police station support, wellbeing support. The list really goes on. If you think you have something to give, even if it's just an hour of your week, it will be well spent with Just Stop Oil. And you could attend an action training. We are now hosting action trainings for lots of different groups, not just Just Stop Oil. And these action trainings are essential if you want to take action and join the fight with us. And now tonight, uh, starting off this talk, we have the brilliant Sharon Daliwell. Sharon founded the UK's leading South Asian culture magazine, Burnt Roti which is a platform for young creatives to showcase their talents, find safe spaces and destigmatize topics around mental health and sexuality amongst others. She is the director of Middlesex Pride and the creative Oh Queer Cupid. Speed dating and comedy night. She's had bylines in ID, HuffPost, The Guardian, and was on the list of global influential women for the BBC 100 Women 2019. She's also been on the Diva Power List 2022 and 2023, Attitude 101 2023, and nominated for broadcast journalist or host of the British LGBT Awards in 2023. Her debut nonfiction, Burning My Roti, about her, how her Asian identity and queerness came up against capitalism and white supremacy, came out in March 2022 by Hardy Grant. And with pleasure, over to you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I want to apologize first um, if the sound goes or if there are any loud noises, um, my reception might be a bit silly, we'll say. So um, I hope it isn't too distracting and I hope you can all hear me. Um, so today's talk, I wanted to start a little bit about the way I was found out about Just Stop Oil and how I got on their radar. So last month, I made a statement on my Instagram saying that I was unable to accept my nomination at the British LGBT Awards when I found out who their sponsors were. They hadn't announced until super late on a post that I didn't see, but their sponsors were Shell and BP, amongst others. It wasn't something I was looking to investigate to begin with because I didn't consider how it would have been funded. That's now changed for me. I make sure I know who I'm align aligning myself to these days. I use my investigating skills for good now, instead of using them to find out who my friends' exes are dating while I'm sitting there summoning Angelina Jolie, like in the film Hackers. Also, by the way, very gay. Um, it's the grassroots organization Tipping Point who first alerted me about the sponsors. And I then found out they'd contacted other nominees. 
that's when I noticed more and more people were pulling out. And it wasn't until Joe Lycett called um, Joe Lycett did it that it finally became newsworthy. Then Shell and BP pulled their sponsorship soon after, making a statement saying they thought it was a shame that as they had wanted to support the community. And I think about that hypocrisy every day. But I kept getting asked why I was tearing down the LGBTQ plus community by calling out a queer event. What have they got to do with anything? People kept asking me. To me, there was no question that climate change affects queer people. And saying other, otherwise signifies we are being othered. It's saying queer people aren't affected by the things that everyone else is because we aren't real. Or if we are real, we aren't worthy. Beyond that, I wanted people to know that it affects us more than straight white people. This is a conversation about queer people of color and how people with privilege will benefit more in a crisis. Looking back in history, for example, we can see that many people of color sexuality has been erased through years of colonialism. Homophobia and transphobia are indeed the British Empire's largest export. It is their laws that criminalize homosexualities and third genders across the world. Queerness runs deep in our veins, historically, through archives, culturally, spiritually, and through simple desire. So if we look at indigenous groups in America, we can see a clear, shameless example of erasure. Many communities who are being publicly decimated by climate change through large businesses and the fossil fuel industry are the indigenous people that have, had, that have a spirituality and culture where their sexuality was erased. Nations and tribes were stripped of their various gender identities through religious indoctrination and homophobic laws. And then it's through no neo-colonialism, which is colonialism that continues when the land is given back, that the global north continues to decimate the lives of queer people of color by first destroying our land globally and then placing us in the worst parts of it so they can continue to benefit. People of color statistically have worse living conditions, earn less money, and don't benefit from, from systems of power. So they will be on the bottom of the feeding chain when it comes to a crisis. More so, when a natural disaster occurs, it is vulnerable people who hurt the most. That's queer people who are significantly more likely to be homeless, for example, or trans people who are more likely to be discriminated against. These people will suffer more than straight white people when there is a disaster. So the climate crisis is absolutely a queer issue, and it's an issue more so for queer people of color. I now wanna talk a little bit about Middlesex Pride. Um, I have a lot of projects I create, and what I like to call my youngest child is Middlesex Pride. It's a free family-friendly event taking part in West London's National Trust, Ostley Park. I grew up in Southall, also known as Little India, and Hounslow, also known as Brownslow, and there is absolutely no queer visibility in these areas. It's a largely immigrant area where people settled by escaping unrest, partition and war in the 60s and 70s up until now. These communities need visibility. And with Middle Middlesex Pride, we're offering them a chance to find family and be seen. We signed the fossil free pledge for our sponsorship of Middlesex Pride. And although we're still searching for a lot of money, we are still able to put on this event. It's an example that we can continue to support our communities without secretly or not so secretly killing them. Trade unions, radio stations, football clubs and councils are our sponsors instead, giving the community a sense of grounding in their homes. For example, the radio station Sunrise Radio I grew up with that would play Punjabi music, that would play Punjabi music blaring out our mum's kitchen at 7 a.m. wanted to give the LGBTQ plus community visibility. That's huge for me. And I know hundreds of people who live or grew up there will feel the same. We are accessible and working with the National Trust to be eco-conscious with our pride and how we use the land. We will be practicing yoga, running nature workshops for people who attend the park around them, as well as making sure our carbon footprint is as low as possible through speaking to our food vendors about biodegradable containers and asking visitors to take public transport. This is what community building looks like to me especially since we aren't looking to destroy the world as we do so. That means the community can continue to exist there for as long as possible. If anyone here wants to support Middlesex Pride, you can go to middlesexpride.co.uk, find our crowdfunder, tell your friends and register to our Eventbrite or come along, just come see us. We would love to see you there. It's on the 12th of August from 12 to 6 p.m. at Osley Park. 
Um, and that's me. Thank you so much for having me and for listening to me talk. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the speakers. I have to run off now. I'm really sorry. I wish I could listen to everyone else. Um, but I hope you have a lovely rest of your hours listening to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was a really fantastic talk. And if you would still here, good luck on the rest of your evening. So our next speaker is one of my personal heroes and a friend of Just Stop Oil, uh, Peter Tatchell, who has campaigned for human rights and LGBTQ plus freedom for over 50 years since 1967. His inspirations are Mahatma Gandhi, Sylvia Pankhurst, Martin Luther King, and to some extent Malcolm X and Rosa Luxemburg. He has participated in 3,000 protests and been arrested nearly 100 times. He was the defeated Labour candidate in the 1983 Bermondsey by-election, the dirtiest, most violent and homophobic election in Britain for 100 years. He twice attempted a citizen's arrest on Robert Mugabe on charges of torture and was beaten up by neo-Nazis in Moscow when he went there to support the attempt by Russian LGBT plus people to hold a pride parade. He was also arrested when he protested at the Football World Cup in Moscow in 2018 and Qatar in 2022. Formerly a, co a coordinator for LGBT direct action group Outrage, he is director of the human rights campaign group, the Peter Tatchell Foundation. There is currently a Netflix documentary about his life called Hating Peter Tatchell. I'm very honored to welcome Peter. Thank you so much. A greetings to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. My starting point is very, very simple. There is no point fighting for LGBT plus rights if we don't have a planet on which to enjoy those rights. So that to me is why the climate crisis is a queer issue and why LGBT plus people must support the struggle to stop the destruction of our planet. It is absolutely vital for us and for everyone. It is a liberation issue just as important as our own LGBT plus liberation. I go back a long time. And if I reflect on my, some of my early beginnings, we're in the Gay Liberation Front in London in the early 1970s. The Gay Liberation Front allied with other social movements. We were primarily concerned about LGBT plus liberation, but we also supported the liberation of women, black and working class people. We recognized that our oppression was just one aspect of many diverse oppressions and that we had an interest and a need, a duty to stand in solidarity with others. So that's why when the women's liberation movement had their huge Miss World protest outside the Royal Albert Hall in 1971. The Gay Liberation Front was there standing in solidarity. It's why when the uh, black activists um, were on trial in the Mangrove Nine trial in the same year and 1972, we were there standing with them in solidarity. For us, unity is strength. Together, we are stronger. We never saw LGBT plus rights in isolation from other freedom struggles. And we recognize that if we work together, if we listen and learn from each other, we can all be collectively stronger. So I guess really the Gay Liberation Front uh, championed what is now called intersectionality. You know, the connections, the solidarity between different social movements and the recognition of course, that LGBT plus people are not just defined by their sexuality or gender identity, but in many cases, they suffer oppression because of their race, their gender, their disability, and umpteen other uh, instances uh, of issues that affect them. So we saw the need to fight for the whole person, the LGBT plus person in their totality, in their totality. And it wasn't just about fighting for LGBT plus rights here in the UK. It was a global struggle. We saw it as a struggle beyond borders, 
to unite all of humanity. And so, for example, one of the earliest protests the Gay Liberation Front did was against the Cuban regime uh, in 1971, against the roundup and internment of LGBT plus people in labor camps where they were subjected to forced re-education. Cuba was far away and many of us were very critical of the United States attempts to overthrow the Cuban revolution, but we were equally opposed to the homophobia of that revolution. And we felt it was really important that this beleaguered minority within Cuba got international publicity and solidarity to show that they were not alone, to support their freedom struggle uh, in Cuba as well. And so it is today, you know, faced with a climate emergency, LGBT plus people must stand with green and environmental campaigners like Just Stop Oil to oppose and overturn the fossil fuel companies and the banks that fund them. You know, the climate crisis is a crisis that affects everyone. And that includes LGBT plus people as well. Um, here in the UK, I always tell the people, look at the flood maps for your local area. Just take a look at the flood maps for a moment. So here in London, if you look at the London flood map, it shows very clearly that large parts of East and South London and parts of West London will face serious regular flooding and eventually become permanently underwater as a result of sea level rises and sea surges and high tides. That is going to destroy the homes and jobs of hundreds of thousands of people in London. And it's replicated in every coastal city in this country. Glasgow, Bristol, Liverpool, you name it, they're all going to be underwater. People are going to find they lose their homes. If they own their homes, they'll become valueless. They won't be able to sell them. Certainly won't be able to insure them. Uh, it'll be curtains. And hundreds of thousands of jobs in those flood areas will be lost. So we're going to see in Britain millions, possibly millions eventually, possibly millions of people displaced. Millions of climate refugees here in Britain, never mind in other parts of the world. So that's why it's so important that LGBT plus people recognize that this is an existential threat to their well-being and futures. Um, of course, if we look across the world, as we've just heard from Sharon, um, in many countries in the global south, they're already experiencing the devastating consequences of climate destruction through floods, fires, uh, landslides, and so on. And it has been already reported in many instances that LGBT plus people affected in these countries often find that they face discrimination when they go to seek aid. We've seen reports of LGBT plus people in refugee camps where they've gone after a climate crisis and they've faced not only prejudice and discrimination from the aid providers, but also violence and threats from other refugees. So the idea that we can say that this isn't a queer issue is simply nonsense. And of course it is LGBT plus people in the global South who are right now facing the biggest challenges. And if we believe in a queer liberation worldwide, if we believe in, believe in LGBT plus freedom for everyone, we have to stand in solidarity with our LGBT plus siblings all across the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words, Peter. Um, next up, we have the incredible Kaklero Kalaniane Kisupale. And Kat is a Botswana-born internationally practicing cultural architect, communication specialist and development practitioner. Her imprints in human rights and social justice span LGBTQ plus advocacy and policy analyses. A broadly published writer, her works include theatre, fiction, children's literature and scholarly research. 
She's been featured by Teen Vogue, Huffington Post, Washington Blade, and Greenpeace. So it is, as always, such an honor to welcome the amazing cast. Hi, everyone. Um... Glad to be with you, and uh, I'm joining you from Botswana, Khaburuni, uh, actually clocking right now, uh, and uh, it's so great to be with you. My talk is really going to be quite short, uh, but very direct, and that's usually how I like to do things. So uh, in terms of looking at how and where we are globally, we I think you are conscious of the, the state of what is happening with evangelists that are coming into Africa as the new frontier and trying to make it uh, the new battleground. But in fact, this isn't something that we're new to. Yet, as we talk about queer liberation, we also can't think of it in a way that is apart from the plight and the livelihoods of people within the African continent. So what I'll say is, if you think of how every single time we frame Africa, we frame it as a place that is full of people who have, you know, um, injustice in terms of the justice system, can't have food insecurity, gender disparities, all of these multitudes of uh, injustices still sit upon queer folks. So what I want us to start thinking about as a global audience, as a global community, is looking at how can we ensure that we aren't just saying there needs to be change, but we are ensuring that uh, when we move forward, where how do we move forward? Who do we move forward with? Uh, it's not so much about the financial. It is, again, beyond this. So when we come back, to looking at right now, the African continent is consistently being stripped of its resources. It's consistently being stripped of uh, the, the things that would otherwise, when we say, let's move green, we don't get the chance to do that because the only way that we on the African continent uh, are able to progress is because of consistently promoting everything that isn't green, because that is how we were founded. This is how we have been valued. And so that is one of the primary issues. So when we look at how do we, as a global movement, engage uh, queer folks within the African continent, how do we do that in a way that is promoting sustenance? And we don't have the answers yet. Right now, these are the questions that the movement is thinking about. How do we develop a sustainable movement that is able to ensure that it is supporting the needs, the decriminalization needs, Firstly, because we've still got these multitudes of criminalizing laws that have been inherited, mind you, from the states that are now talking green policy. How do we ensure that Africans are able to talk green when, in fact, right now we're fighting for our lives? And this is where we believe the global movement, especially when we're looking at the green movement, needs to start talking about how to, to move greenness, not just as, oh yes, the world needs it, but who are the people in the world? And for the African continent, more 
than anything else. We need everybody else to see us as humans. We need to be seen as people who are contributors to the greater good, who are contributors to everything that makes the world go round, but essentially also not to be seen as victims of how the world goes round. So this is one of those issues that I want to bring to us as we talk today about what queer liberation looks like when we talk about climate justice as well. Because as Peter has said, there can't be queer liberation if we don't even think about the world that we're going to be liberated within. So how do we ensure that when we are looking and investing and supporting queer Africans, we are also supporting queer Africans in a way that they are able to join the various movements that we're looking to keep establishing and supporting. I, as a single person myself, am able to engage with actions such as has been done by Just Stop Oil. Um, I'm able to engage in so many other ways. However, what are we doing as a broader movement to say we are willing and able and supporting you as marginalized geographically, economically people who are still very, very important towards ensuring that we reach this goal of essentially stopping oil, where we can't stop oil if that is what people's livelihoods are dependent on. So how do we ensure that we are part of the solution and not just saying, hey, here is a bit of a problem. And of course, we do know that there are many, many avenues. These avenues need to be availed to the folks here. And you as, and we, actually not even you, we are in possession of that power of changing and re-scripting how we are able to solve this problem. So I just want to say when it comes down to the wire, we shouldn't look at folks like me as disempowered because we've got so many folks who are working. And I would invite you all to start looking into what are the various movements that are climate sensitive? What are the movements that are um, queer affirmative that are working towards ensuring that we aren't suffering climate change, but we are proactive and ensuring that we are able to um, circumvent how we suffer or survive. That is what I know of the people on the African continent. That is what I know of my people. <laughs> Uh, in Bolzana, we've got the Bolzana Climate Change, uh, the Bolzana Climate Network, who are doing amazing work producing documentaries, um, trying to get people sensitized beyond just thinking of, I'm a farmer, because a lot of the way that we have come to be, and a lot of the ways that we have come to be seen is subsistence but we want to now move towards a space of prosperity, not just a means of, yes, you farm, you, the climate is the way that you are able to live, but to say, how do we prosper? How do we compete? How do we keep moving forward without killing that very thing and the very thing 
that is embedded in our language. It's embedded in our sayings. It's embedded in our ways of life. It's in our traditions. How do we ensure that we keep it alive without forsaking it for the purposes of supposed development? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now and finally, we're going to hear a testimony from one of our own. And this is a personal story from the voice and perspective of one of the amazing queer Just Stop World supporters, Zosha. And Zosha is 22 years old and has been studying economics at university because they believe that it is the capitalist ideology of never ending economic growth that has been the main barrier to climate action in countries across the globe. And they aim to change that in their career when they leave university. Now, they've only recently joined Just Stop Oil, but have dove straight into action as part of a proud seven, one of the Just Stop Oil supporters who took action at Pride London. Before that, they were in Extinction Rebellion for a few years. And now we are so proud to pass over to Zosha. Hi, everyone. Um, I feel honoured to be um, part of, of this talk after some amazing speakers. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Zosha, as Anna said. I'm 22, um, I'm bisexual, genderqueer, uh, my pronouns are she, they. Um, and yeah, I was part of um, the, the Proud Seven. I took action at Pride in London on the 1st of July. Um, so, the, you know, the intersections between climate justice and queer rights are so important and they really can't be ignored. You know, they can't, we can't separate these two things. Um, and the reason I took part in this action is because London Pride, it's become this corporate pink washing event where, where big corporations just, just you know, use the, use the Pride flag, the rainbow flag on their logos um, and pretend that they support us and the community, the queer community, when in reality, they, a lot of them are funding climate breakdown, which will disproportionately impact queer communities and people of colour, particularly in the global south of course, as we know. Um, I mean, leading up to the action, um, I was feeling very nervous. Um, it was kind of, it was a little bit chaotic um, because we um, we didn't know exactly which corporate float we were going to target. Um, but then one of us spotted, um, one of my friends spotted the Coca-Cola float from afar and we thought, perfect, you know, they're the biggest plastic, plastic polluter in the world. Um, so they are really, they're one of the contributors to the climate crisis and the waste that um, comes from the climate crisis. Um, so, yeah, so there wasn't a concrete plan. I was nervous um, and, you know, I was aware that there could be police presence. You know, police aren't always like, very um, supportive of us and they kind of don't really cut us any slack. Um, they can be a bit unfair with us sometimes. Um, while, I've, you know, when we went onto the road and I was just sat there, my heart was really racing. Um, we were chanting and stuff, but because of all the people shouting in, like in front of us, they were like right up into our faces. Um, it was a little bit scary. I mean, I've done things like that before. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, that I, I was aware of some like police around um, talking to some of the others, um, but no police officer came and directly spoke to me um, until I was arrested. Um, yeah, so around after around 15 minutes that we were sat on the road, um, there was probably about 20 police officers that came just came marching in. Um, the best I could I describe it is like a swarm, like they were coming in for us. Um, and it was a little bit scary. Um, I did actually try to move off the road um, because I wasn't planning to get arrested. Um, but yeah, it, it, they came in like a swarm, almost as if they thought we were dangerous, that we were gonna harm anyone. And um, when we were, you know, we're fighting for all life on earth and we ourselves are members of the commit, were com um, members of the queer community so um yeah it was quite disheartening when people cheered when they carried us off um when they arrested us um 
yeah, it was it was very sad. Um, they handcuffed me straight away um, because they thought I was a flight risk um, because I tried to flee um, and the handcuffs were very tight. Um, what, you know, they kept them on in the police van on the way to the station, even though I was, uh, you know, in an enclosure, in a little cage. I don't know, you know, I had bruises from it. Anyway, I'm, I'm fine now, but yeah. Um, while I was in jail, I was very anxious because um, I hadn't actually planned to get arrested. Um, and I was particularly worried about what my parents might think. Um, my mum's actually on this call right now, so sorry, mum. Um, <laughs> so like after the, and like when I came out of, um, of jail, I was just, I was really exhausted the next day as well um, and drained and, you know, had been drained of quite a lot of energy but I was still proud of myself and the reactions of from the public we got a mixed reaction as always with just a oil but it was still a positive reaction um and response and that made me even more proud and happy to have been a part of that um yeah I'm, I'm proud of what we did um and I hope there'll be more like that in the future um yeah yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much about Sasha. Uh, Sasha is a personal friend of mine, and I was just so thrilled to see them in the, in the recording because I was with everyone at that action. It really holds a special place in my heart. Um, it's about so it's at the end of this talk now, and I just want to extend such a, a wealth of gratitude to everyone who has spoken at this talk. It is such an inspiration to hear from you all.